Talk about the keys of the kingdom. We want to start in Luke 12, 32. You know, Jesus told Peter, and through him the church, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. What are the keys to the kingdom? I, I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on it. And I don't usually like to teach something unless I know definitively. Okay, this I can say definitively. But you know, Jesus said he's going to give us the keys to the kingdom. So whether they're enumerated as such or not, he must have given. Are we all on board there? So we're going to take a look at that. In Luke 12, Jesus was teaching and he said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Now, I think most of us, when we think of Colossians 1.13, that he delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, we know we're in the kingdom, right? We know we're in it. But did you know you're a fellow heir with Jesus? It says that, that the kingdom he gave to Jesus and then he made us join heirs. When we go to heaven, we're not like guests that kind of have to have their past revalidated once in a while. We're not guests, we're heirs. The kingdom belongs to us like it belongs to Jesus. Now it's all God. I know that's far out, but if you won't look it up in Romans 8, Maybe we better go to Romans 8. Got your Bibles? Let's go to Romans 8. See if we're exaggerating. Don't want to teach something that's not so. We just want to know what's so. Verse 15 says, or verse 14 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That means you're full-fledged sons of God as much as Jesus is the Son of God, right? For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption of sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, now look at this, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. In the, in the Greek it's joined heirs. That means share and share like heirs. So it means, and you say, that's, isn't this blasphemous? No, I just read it out of the Bible. He is the Lord. He will always be Lord, okay? But as far as the kingdom, we have been given not only a right to live there, we've been given the kingdom. Amen. Now that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, now go to Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus has just asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And he said, you're the Christ. He said, you're Peter. Upon that revelation knowledge, I'll build a church. Now watch. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Could we read that from the New Living? <clears throat> I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Woo! Yeah, I mean, it's really, really good because what we're really doing tonight is we're continuing the study on eliminating fear, getting fear out of our lives. But to know that, you have to know that you have the right to, and then we'll pick up two weeks from today. We'll have special services with John Routon, no service Wednesday, but two weeks from today, we'll pick it up. But if he's given you the key to the kingdom, yeah. that means that not only has he given you the kingdom, and you don't just get to live there. You've not only been transferred, so you live there, it's... We're heirs of that kingdom. Think about it. We're heirs. We walk the golden streets owning it. I mean, we're not guests there. We're, we're part of the clan. We're part of the family. And then Jesus goes one step further. And he says, behold, I will give you the keys. As soon as you can get born again. Couldn't give them to him then. He hadn't been to the cross yet. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, what I notice about keys is if I were to give this set of keys, these are all these church keys within the sanctuary. I used to keep them all in my ignition key. And the man who works in my ignition said, you do not want, or well, my man said, if you don't do that, you're going to replace your ignition at the tune of $200. So we don't do that. If I were to give this to you, it would be an enormous trust of responsibility and authority. I mean, I, if I give somebody these keys, it means that I trust you with my life. Because my, I'd, I'd lay down my life for this church. I have. You know? When somebody gives you keys, they give you authority. And they give you responsibility. And they show enormous trust. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, how many of us agree? Jesus said he'd give us the keys. Now, nowhere in scripture are those keys enumerated. But I'm going to give you seven things that I believe qualify as keys to the kingdom of God. Because to have a key 
means that you can enforce something. You keys open doors and they lock doors. Yeah. They okay? Mm -hmm. The first one I, I believe is found in Matthew 18, 18 and 19. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Thanks. And again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Now, he just got done talking about binding and loosing on earth in heaven. I believe that the prayer of agreement is one of the keys to the kingdom. I don't think we understand the power. Every Christian, you have more power in prayer than you realize. But when two of us come together and we're absolutely in agreement and love and say, Father, this is the way it needs to be done on earth. Thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name is another key. Yeah. There is so much power. The Old Testament said, one shall chase a thousand and two ten thousand. When we come together in prayer, it does not go up linearly like this. It goes up exponentially. And you say, do you completely understand? No, I don't completely understand it. But as long as the church stays in unity, and we're not fighting, we're crying when people leave because we love them so much, that, that kind of love, you can get your prayers answered. And everybody say the prayer of agreement prayer. is one of the keys to the kingdom of God. So that's number one if you're taking notes. Let's look at number two. Acts 3, 4 to 6, the man who's been lame since birth. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I don't possess silver and gold, but I'll, I'll take out my keys. Yeah. I don't possess silver and gold, but I got a set of keys. Okay? Okay, I'm just have some of these things I'm just introducing for you to think about, all right? The name of Jesus is not a good luck charm. When, when a woman buries a man and they have joint checking accounts, he gives her his name and he gives her authority to write checks on his account. When you are not, I like the way Joyce Marks says, not just dating Jesus, where you proclaim him. When you come into solid covenant with him, where your life is his and his is yours, you have the right to write checks on the name of Jesus. Then, without any doubt, the name of Jesus is one of the keys to the kingdom. And he said, here. I don't have a lot of money, but I've got some keys in the name of Jesus. Walk. And he right. walked the door to that man's healing, and he got up and he walked for the first time in his life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. What I noticed about the keys is that they're really not complicated. So the first key would be the prayer of agreement when two are in unity or more in unity. Number two is the name of Jesus. Key number three is the blood of the Lamb. I know you know this scripture, but I want you to think about it. It's Revelation 12:11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. I think I told you the last time Ron Bruce was here, we were having lunch and preachers never quit preaching. They preach over lunch, they preach over lunch. Okay. And he just started on one of his pet peeves and he said, the thing I get that bothers me about that verse in Revelation is everybody quotes it and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and their word of their testimony. Stop. And I said, there's three parts to that verse. And if you ask my congregation, they know all three parts. Because it does, there's three keys in this verse. Everybody say three keys. Now, just because I don't like the shape of one of these keys, some of these are much prettier than other keys. Okay, the ones on the new sanctuary still have a shine to them. Some of those from the, they're, they're still keys. There are some doors that will not be open unless I take one of the uglier looking keys. Now, some of you might not like not loving your life to death, but it's a key to the kingdom. It's the key of authority. And we're going to go through all three of these. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. For two reasons, you have to have the blood of the lamb to have authority. We're talking, when, when I was talking about the keys to the kingdom, we're talking about keys to a victorious, successful life in God, in the kingdom of God right now. Okay? That's why you have keys. The reason, and I'm going to show you two scriptures here, please. First John 1, 7. First reason you need the blood is because every day we miss it in little ways. We walk, we walk in less than perfect love. That doesn't mean there's a lot of condemnation, but look what it says. Read it with me. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, 
We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you look it up in the Greek, it's a continual thing. We, if we walk in the light, it's continuously cleansing us. That means that if we're walking in fellowship with God, desiring, there is a continual cleansing where you can live without guilt before God. <laughs> and you say, why do you get so emotional? If you don't know your righteousness, the devil will come at you. And as soon as it comes at you, before you can even pray a prayer, he'll say, you remember how you screamed at those kids yesterday? I didn't say I did. I'm just using an example. He will use some place where you messed up and say, no way, Jose. You are not going to take authority over me in your condition. And that's where you better know that the blood of Jesus has paid for your righteousness. I'm not talking about living in rank sin. You live in rank sin. We're going to see. It doesn't work. But if you're doing the best you know, the blood continually cleanses us. Look at 1 Peter 1.18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood, as of a lamb and blemish and spotless, the blood of Christ. There's two things you have to know about the blood if you want fear out of your life. Number one is that it's your redemption price, where you belong to Satan and he, he just, woo, and you don't have a right to get free of fear. You say, wait a minute, I'm redeemed. The blood was paid. I don't belong to you in any way, shape, or form, and you have nothing in me any more than you had in Jesus. And when he says, yes, but you missed a Thursday afternoon, then you say, yes, but the blood of Jesus is on. I walk in the light. He himself is in the light. That blood is continually cleansing. If you don't know that key to the kingdom, the devil will kick your brains out for the very fact that you are not yet perfect. Okay? So you walk in love the very best you know, and then you flee the blood. Hallelujah. So, so far we have the prayer of agreement, the name of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. And then I was thinking about this third part. If we could go back to Revelation 12, 11. It says the word of their testimony. And now when we hear that word testimony, we think of like testimonies that we gave a few minutes ago here. Okay? But this is what I believe the word of our testimony is. The word of our testimony is saying exactly what God says on the situation. Let's look at the word of Jesus' testimony. In Matthew chapter 4, you can just read it up here. When, when the devil told him, look, that's in the shape of a bread already, that stone. Just take it, turn it into bread. Use your supernatural power selfishly. How did he overcome the devil? With the word of his testimony, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That is the word of your testimony. If, you know, listen, follow this. Because when he says, yeah, but your leg really hurts today. You're not healed. The, the word of my testimony is that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, I am healed. We were healed and I am healed. That's, yeah. Now look what Jesus, this is his testimony. He agreed with God. His testimony was, whether I'm hungry or not, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let's look at the next verse. When he took him to the pinnacle of the temple, said, jump. Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I will, I, I'm just putting some things out for you to think of tonight. I believe the word of our testimony is when we put this word in our mouth and we say, fear, you will have no place in my life or in my kid's life because God has not given me a demonic spirit of fear. You are outlawed. The word of your testimony is this Bible in your mouth. And you say, well, what if I can't prove I'm guilty? Look, you cannot lie saying the Bible. No. You can't. Do you want to look it up in Isaiah 53? It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our shalom, our well-being was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. It says are healed in Isaiah. Peter looking back said we're healed. You can say that before you can prove it. Because Jesus said it. That's the word of your testimony. Is what God says in a situation. The third time he did it again. The devil came at him. And he said, thou don't worship me. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world and glory. He said, all these I'll give to you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, get out, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He fought him with the word of God. The word of his testimony was word for word. Why? Because there's overcoming life in the word of God. And you say, oh, man, you get worked out. I believe this is a key to the kingdom. It's just fighting out. Amen. Okay, I'll say something radical. Get y'all around that. If you spent an hour a day in the Word this week, and you did that for one month, 
you would have more powerful faith than if you don't. And that's not condemnation, the same is true of me and anybody else. But you have to know what God says. If you're going to just slam the brains out of fear, I mean, I hate fear. I hate it. I hate the torment involved. You have to know what the Word of God says. So, so far, we've had the, the prayer of agreement, the name of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. And then, if we go back to Revelation 12, 11, it says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. They knew they were righteous. By the word of their testimony, they just said what God said, and you could like it or you could not like it. They said what God said. And they did not love their life, even when faced to death with death. Now, when we read the last third of that verse, we think of our brothers and sisters in Kenya who physically laid down their lives today. Okay? I'll tell you right now, I have taught my kids. I know I'm radical. I taught you this morning. I never did teach any. My kids know almost no nursery rhymes and almost no, uh, what do you call it, fairy tales. And I am not against you if you taught nursery rhymes or fairy tales. It's not bad. But I was, I went through a time in my life where without the word of God, I couldn't think straight. And I wanted so passionately for my children to understand what was true and what was not true. But one of the things, I'll just tell you right now, you show me, you know, you have a right to walk in a healthy body till the day you go home, but yet there is no promise that we will never be martyred. Not seeking martyrdom, not praying for martyrdom. But I taught my kids from the time they were two years old, if you ever have to choose between Jesus and death, you hold on to Jesus because he'll give you eternal, eternal life and that death won't hurt more than one moment. Amen. I taught my kids that. But you see, this is not where we stumble because we live in the United States of America. We be blessed. You lay down your life to two thrones on this week. That's right. These, these Throngs on if you don't know what it is. We're busting in the kids from the projects, loving on them. These teenagers pour their love on them. Just take care of them, give them a good, and then teach them the scripture. That's laying down your life. Because the beach is right over there, you know? Okay. A surrendered life is one of the keys to unlimited authority in the kingdom of God. And you say, oh, wow, I surrendered my life today and I haven't lived it. No, but you will grow. For every year that you walk with God and you're faithful, the anointing on your life grows. It's the most precious thing in this world. I heard Jesse DePlantis did a series with Ken Copeland about it on their daily a few weeks ago. That was just the power of a faithful life. And he said, well, what is, what is the power of a faithful life? It's just getting up in the morning, Romans 12, 1, if we could see that, and saying, okay, Lord, I, I present my body. Yeah. Yes. To you, by the mercy of God, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God which is your spiritual service of worship. And you say, that doesn't sound like fun. Well, this is why we do it. Number one, because we love God and Jesus. He really suffered. He's not asking you to go to the cross just to obey him that day. Yeah. Number one. Number two, God's plan for your life. Listen to me. You want to say, what is God's plan for your life? Here it is. I don't know the details, but I promise you the overarching plan of God. His plan for your life is whatever will bring the most people with you to heaven. He loves. He loves so much he can't stand to think of people going to hell. So I don't know what your, God's plan for your life will be, but I promise you it will include bringing as many people to heaven with you as you can. And you say, I've got a better idea. I doubt it. <laughs> no, you know what I'm saying? I, I, that's what I was a kid. I, I had my plan. And I, I'm going to bring people. The reason we surrender is because he's the one with the plan. Okay? Yeah. So you, let, you, you present your body a living and holy sacrifice. And you say, well, how do I get out of it? Okay. First of all, you do it because you love God. Second of all, you do it because you love people. And you just want people in heaven with you. Yeah. If you want to make it, how many of you just like to make dad happy? Say, I, when I stand there, I want him smiling. I want him cheering. I want the saints cheering. Well, then you, what you do in the morning is you say, guess what? To the, tomorrow is July 2nd, 2012. And I can't really present the rest of my life to you because you can't live a life at a time. You live a day at a time. Right. You get up in the morning and you say, this day, I was at me, a living sacrifice. I'd like to be a blessing to everybody I contact today. Even the salespeople have to talk over the phone. Help me not. Everybody, make me a blessing. And you say, wait a minute. You talk what God gets out of it. You talk about what people get out of it. They go to heaven. What do I get out of it? Listen, this is what you get out of it. A lifetime of increasing favor of God. A lifetime. It's a key to the kingdom. When you decide, I am going to live a surrendered life, what are the three, but how do they overcome the devil? 
By the blood of the Lamb, they let his blood make them righteous, and they knew they were the righteousness of God in Christ. By the word of their testimony, you just decide, I'm going to say what God says because I believe he's honest. And number three, I love not my life to death. When you do that, you will overcome the devil like clockwork. You say, how do you know? Well, look, go, look, that's what it says. Read it with me. And they overcame him. Okay, look at look at it. How many of us love the name of Jesus? Yeah. I've heard many, many people say the name of Jesus is the key to the kingdom. They're right. It's such a pretty key. We got it for free when we married him. We're the bride of Christ, and he gave us his name, and it works. Yeah. Thank God it works. If you're even halfway submitted, the name of Jesus works. Well, I've got a couple keys on here that are really not good looking. This is the old key at the other center door. And you say, I think you should get rid of it. It is not pretty, and the pink cover's coming. Yeah, but if I need to lock that upper center door, I need this key. And when you want authority on your life, you're going to need the key of not loving your life even to death. And I don't mean you'll be a martyr. I mean that you will go God's way because that's the... Yeah. And you say, but what do you get out of it? Routinely overcoming the devil. Yes. Every day that you live overcoming the devil. I think that's good. That's what you're talking about. Okay, let's wrap this up. We're going to get in groups and just pray about some stuff. Everybody, you'll get to meet somebody and pray. And first, we're going to pray for you, Jesse, okay? All right, so the first five keys were the prayer of agreement in the name of Jesus and the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony, and a surrendered life. I believe the sixth key is revelation knowledge. I believe the reason that we love teaching in this church is because when you see something revealed, it's here's the rest of your life. I, I couldn't see the baptism of the Holy Spirit for over a solid year when my grandma told me. I mean, I couldn't see it. Well, once I got it, no one's going to tell me the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost isn't real. It's too late. They got the revelation of it. Look at what Jesus said. This comes from um, Luke 11, 52. Thank you. They got that. Jesus said, woe to you lawyers. Now, the lawyers were not our kind of lawyers. The lawyers were sc scholars in the, in the law, the Old Testament law. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves didn't enter, and you hindered those who were entering. There were keys of revelation knowledge in David's day that he already had a handle on that these people were blind to. And if you think not, look at what he says in Matthew 15, 14. He said, let them alone, speaking of the Pharisees, they are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. In other words, he says, you took away keys that they already had. Understanding that they were starting to get, you took it away. Now, what I'm trying to say in this is that any revelation from God becomes a light in our lives. You have light in your life that you didn't have six months ago. Lots of it. And every, you know, she's been, you've been saved and filled with the Spirit in the last six months. So, so it's just so exciting. But I don't care how long you've been saved and filled with the Spirit. We should have way more light in our lives today in July 2012 than in July 2011. That's why it's exciting to serve Jesus. There's no... Yeah. Hallelujah. Paul prayed for the keys of revelation to be given to the church. Now, he didn't call it a key, but understand this. Jesus promised Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. I'll give you the kingdom, I'll give you the keys. You've got authority in the kingdom. He never calls all of these things. He never gives us a list. I'm just trying to come up. Okay. Look at Ephesians. I know you know the prayer, but let's look at it. Anyhow. Ephesians 1, 16 to 18. He prays, God. He said, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. We'll just stop there. When you start seeing things in God, if you ever lose your vision for your life, you need to just get away and get with God until you can see again. If I ever lose my vision for this church, I think this is the craziest thing I have ever heard of in my life. What in the world? Duh. What is going on here? You can't afford to lose your seeing. You have to be able to see where you're going. And you say, what do you mean by seeing? I don't mean a... a Dave was talking to me like, what's the next step? And that's okay, Dave. I mean, when we got this building, I had never envisioned anything this pretty, okay? But I knew one thing from God. We needed a building. There were people that were agreeing, yes, we need a building. We need it now. And I knew we had to find the right contractor. So I prayed dramatically in my first I prayed desperately. 
you've got to bring me to the right person because the wrong person can kill us. If, you know, I don't know enough about building. I prayed for over a year. And you say, why is that important? Because you've got to be able to see where you're going. I don't know if this is making sense. But revelation is one of the keys to the kingdom. When, let me tell you something. Hear me. If you're struggling with a sin, here's what you do. Okay, I have no problem with crack or bath salts. Like, you could bring me $20 million of crack, all the pot in the world, and now something called bath salts. I say, it's free, Pastor. You couldn't tempt me with it for one reason I can see straight through. I can see from here to the end of crack and what it does to people, and I say, no, thank you. That's now listen, I don't care what sin it is that you are dealing with. If you can say, Jesus, help me see. Help me see from here to the end of that sin. You can see through adultery. You don't want adultery. I don't care what it is, homosexuality, whatever it is. If you can see through to the other side, you want to throw up and you say, I hate that sin. All you need is to be able to see. It's one of the keys of the kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? That also works in a positive way. You get the vision for your life. You don't know all the details. I told him, I said, I don't know all the details. I know that right now we need to pay this mortgage off. And we're, and we're doing the very best we can and God's going to help. But the next thing is going to be a youth building. And I believe it will be, we already have, you know, if we wanted to have classes for youth, we could use this building. You said that, Jim, and you're absolutely right. But we need a place where even in the winter they can get some of their energy out. They need a place to play basketball or something in the winter, okay? And could we crowd it onto this property? I don't know yet. It wouldn't be a matter of crowding on the property if you getting permits. But I'm saying God doesn't give you this entire huge plan for your life, and then after you've seen the whole thing, you live it like a rerun. No. Wouldn't that be boring? <laughs> don't tell me seeing some I Love Lucy that you've seen 30, I don't watch it, but 30 times. It runs in my house sometimes. If you've seen it before, don't tell me it's as good the second time through. Wouldn't it be awful if God showed you, listen, uh, your whole life, and then you live the whole life as a rerun? How not exciting. Come on. Right? Yeah. But, I'm trying to help you understand that. Let me tell you that God likes to give glimpses. Everybody say glimpses. Yes. Glimpses are enough light to see where you're headed and, and what the next step should be. I'll tell you, can I tell you a secret? Or something? A secret. Well, <laughs> 2002, the last meeting I was ever in with Kenneth and Hagen, it was in Hampton, Virginia. When Dad Hagen ministered, he had such a glorious anointing that just heaven would come down. He had spoken on that verse of Psalm 31 where it says, How great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear thee, which you have laid up for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. And he's spoken on that, and it's just like heaven became real. And he said, Just laugh, just enjoy God and the good future he has planned. So I began to worship. And as I began to worship, here's where we were. Gordon had died exactly a year before. We had managed to muddle our way. I mean, y'all were wonderful, but oh, it was hard getting the renovations done. This place was a mess. We got into the building, and then afterwards, we just kind of had a skeletal crew in the building. And I said, God, are we going to survive? And so I'm worshiping, and as I'm worshiping, all of a sudden, I get a, mic a micro flash, a vision, and I started laughing. And some people don't believe in laughing in the spirit. I don't believe in making it up, but when it happens, it's real. And I started laughing for joy because I could see, I said, the biggest problem that church has is getting the English-speaking congregation out fast enough that they can get the Spanish-speaking congregation in. And you say, that's happened? No. But I knew this sanctuary was coming when we just barely moved into that first one. Uh -huh. And you say, why? Because God wanted us. He's, he's going to give you enough light to always make the right decisions and move in the right direction. That are you following me? That doesn't mean you're going to live your life like a rerun. But revelation is one of the keys. When Peter, I, I was going to take us there, but in Acts chapter 10, when Peter had the vision of the unclean animals coming down and the voice saying, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Never, I've never eaten anything unclean. And he said, What I call clean, don't I call unholy. Then he takes them to Cornelius' house. Then do you have Acts chapter 10, the second group of scriptures? I think it's 34 and 35. Look at what he says. Peter is speaking by revelation. Dear God, the Gentiles can get saved. He couldn't believe it. It's unbelievable. His mom had told him not, you know. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. This is huge. 
But in every nation, the man who fears him, him and does what is right is well with him. Now see, what does this have to do with anything? This was a key that unlocked the door for you and me, the Gentiles, to enter the kingdom. They had left all the Gentiles out of the evangelism for over 10 years. At least 10 years that they've been... No. Revelation unlocked Peter's understanding. The revelation of the vision. And then the revelation, dear God, these people are speaking in tongues. You know? Here we go. There's, you will not get to every place you need to be in life without hearing some things from God. And you say, that's scary. No, God talks. Okay, no, okay. If you say, that's scary. Now listen. Before you get revelation straight from God about the future, you're going to get revelation. Well, I don't have a Bible here, an iPad, but whatever Bible you got, you're going to get it from the Word of God. And where you pick it up, and it used to just be dry words, all of a sudden he'll start speaking to you and showing you things. That revelation knowledge is one of the keys that what it does is it breaks chains off of you. If you can look at spirit, a lot of us, we've got chains we don't know we've got just from, I mean, it could be racial prejudice. It could be a thousand different things, okay? And that revelation just systematically unlocks chains. All right, is that how you following? Paul prayed for revelation because it is impossible for the devil to keep you bound with sickness or anything else if you if you can see and the keys of the kingdom. We've got to stop because it's time to pray. The last one is the agape love of God. Just look at um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and we're done. It says the fruit of the, hope of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Gentle and self-control against such things there is no law. There is no force of the enemy that can counteract love. If you go back a verse where it says, you see, none of those punctuations in the Greek. The Greek has no punctuation. A lot of scholars believe that there should be a colon after love. But the fruit of the Spirit is, because it's singular, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then in parentheses, joy, peace, all the fruits of love. Love is a major key to the kingdom. Day. A lot of times people don't get until they're a little more mature. If you'll walk in love and respect people, God, it just brings anointing, authority. All right, does this make sense? Yes. So let's put the list up there one more time, and then we're going to... What are these things meant to do? They were given to you as an heir of the kingdom to change things in your life in God's direction, in God's will, okay? The prayer of agreement, the name of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and I believe that also means saying what God says in the word, a surrendered life, revelation knowledge, and that God paid love. If you walk in those seven things, you can have a victorious life. And you may, like I said, like some of the keys more than others, but you need every one of them. There isn't one that you don't need, including a surrendered life. It brings authority.